over Sunday. 111 on Saturday Sports Line. Mike Lee along with Randy Shaver. And on our live line for this afternoon, Maury Allen. He has authored a very interesting book. And we'll get to that just a little bit. We'd like to tell you, you can call in here at WHO Saturday Sports Line to talk baseball. 282-5111, the local line. And 1-800-532-1111, the toll-free Watts line for the state of Iowa. Maury's book is called Baseball's 100, a personal ranking of the greatest players in baseball history. He also has another book out. Maury, I understand it's called Mr. October, and why don't you enlighten our listeners and myself as to who Mr. October is. Well, I think most baseball fans recognize the nickname. It's about Reggie Jackson. It's uh, uh, a biography of Reggie, not an authorized biography, and uh, uh, I think because it is not an authorized biography, we've been able to tell the readers and the fans a lot more about him than he might uh, tell himself and I had a lot of fun putting it together I think he's one of the most uh, exciting characters in baseball both on and off the field a rather electric personality and I think anybody interested in in baseball or in stardom and in, in American life and folk heroes negative or positive I think would be interested in reading uh, Mr. October. Maury, do you think you would have wrote the book had uh, Reggie Jackson stayed out in Oakland or uh, some other place besides New York where, where you're at? I think uh, uh, part of it is that coming to New York, he did get a great deal of media attention. I think he was always a very good player, uh, a dominant player on, a, on what I think was the best baseball team in modern times, the, the Oakland A's. Uh, the three World Series uh, championships in a row, I think, is a feat that not many teams will will be able to equal. Only three other teams in baseball history uh, were able to equal it or better it, and that was the Yankees of uh, 36 to 39, and, and again the Yankees under Casey Stengel from uh, 49 to 53. So those Oakland teams of 72, 3, and 4 were obviously sensational baseball teams, and, and Reggie was a significant personality on those teams. And when he came to New York, I think it was uh, part show business, part uh, New York media, but the confrontations among Reggie and Billy Martin and George Steinbrenner, uh, I think made the whole country sort of get caught up in this furor, and uh, it's part of what's made Reggie, I think, a bigger personality than he, he might have been if he stayed in Oakland. That's exactly what I was uh, going to ask you, you know, uh, now that uh, Dave Winfield is out there from San Diego. Uh, how is that situation shaping up with Reggie Jackson? I know you're uh, on top of the Yankees situation. Uh, I know during the summer that he was kind of upset he wasn't getting the intention that uh, maybe he really does deserve, but uh, was overshadowed with the signing of Winfield. How is that situation shaping up now? I think what's interesting about the relationship there is that it really depends on the, the personality of the people involved. Uh, Winfield signed the biggest contract in, in baseball history, a million and a half a year for something like 10 years. Total package with bonuses and incentives and so forth is going to uh, going to measure about $20 million. And I think Reggie's a little upset that he's not making that kind of money. Uh, Reggie only makes, and I put only sort of in quote, $600,000 a year now, and that's a relatively low salary, uh, the way salaries have uh, gone wild in baseball, and this is his option year, in other words, he finishes his contract at the end of 1981, he's looking for a much bigger contract, and as a result of that, there's been a lot of pressure on him, and uh, he has not had a good start, but he's hit five home runs, and uh, uh, he's beginning to hit the ball a little better. The Yankees are beginning to win. But he seems to get along quite well with Winfield. The Winfield has a low-key personality. He, he does have a strong ego. He's quite proud of his achievements. Okay, Maury, we'll talk a little bit about that later, and we'll put you on standby as we get ready for a sports summary from the AP. The 106th Preakness is on tap this afternoon in Baltimore. 13 three-year-olds will race, which is well down from the field of 21 two weeks ago at Churchill Downs for the Kentucky Derby. Flying Nash was a horse with good credentials for the race, and trainer Larry Barrera looks at the race this way. It's going to be fairly difficult, but I don't know if it's going to be muddy or not, but I feel that uh, the position I'm in, I'm in a good position, and I can't, I don't have to lose all that those length, uh, position before the first turn. I'm in a good position when I break this time. 
contract of head football coach Jackie Sherrill. The new deal runs for five years. With Sherrill as coach, Pittsburgh has a four-year mark of 38 wins, eight losses, and a tie. In Cleveland last night, the Indians beat the Toronto Blue Jays 3-0 as 25-year-old Len Barker threw the first perfect game in the big league since May of 1968. Barker was a 19-game winner last year, made no mistakes last night. He faced just 27 men and threw just 103 pitches. Confirmed pitching today, Toronto at Cleveland. Todd goes for the Jays, Garland for Cleveland. California, Detroit, Raul against Rosma. Baltimore at Minnesota, Steve Stone against Kuzman. Later this afternoon, the American League, Kansas City, is at Boston. This is Jack Briggs on the Sports Line. Remodeling your kitchen is the quickest way to increase the value of your home. This week, Plywood Minnesota is featuring new Mid-Cotton and Oak Manor cabinets at 40% off manufacturer's list price. Here's quality oak construction throughout with clean contemporary styling. Pre-assembled, pre-finished cabinets ready to install. Drawers have double suspension for smooth opening. Doors have self-closing hinges. An outstanding cabinet value at 40% off manufacturer's list price. See these beautiful new cabinets on display now at Plywood, Minnesota. Bring in your kitchen measurements and our expert kitchen planners will plan your new kitchen free. Check Plywood, Minnesota specials on a matching Oak Manor 24-inch vanity, cultured marble top, and peerless faucet at only $119 complete. Save 40% at over 50 styles of imported ceramic tile and 40% at 100 selected in-stock wallpapers. Single rolls of wallpaper start as low as $269. Easy Care Vinyl Cushion Floor by Congolium is just $8.99 a square yard now at Plywood, Minnesota in Des Moines, Ottawa, Carroll, Creston, Fort Dodge, and Marshalltown. Plywood, Minnesota makes it easy to have that new kitchen of your dreams. The Sound of Sports. All sports here at 10:40 on the WHO Saturday Sports Line. <laughs> The time here at WHO is 118. Randy Shaver along with Mike Lee on Saturday Sports Line. 70 degrees in downtown Des Moines. On the line right now, Maury Allen. He's written a book uh, talking about baseball's top 100. He has uh, taken the liberty to rank them, which is uh, quite a feat in itself. First of all, Maury, why don't you explain to people uh, how you went about uh, ranking uh, the players that you did, uh, maybe not mentioning uh, them by name. We'll get to that in a minute. But just the whole system surrounding what you did, how much research, how much time you put into it, and uh, everything uh, mechanically that you did with this book. All right, basically this is a personal ranking, of course, of, of the greatest players of the 20th century. Uh, the only limit that I made, just a sort of a mechanical limit to uh, try to confine myself to a reasonable amount, was eliminated. I eliminated any player who played before the 20th century. In other words, a player like... Honus Wagner, for example, who's obviously a great player, was not in the list because he played in the, in the 19th century, or a player like Cy Young. Uh, so starting with the 20th century, that's some 10,000 players. I, I went through a lot of the statistics. I analyzed a lot of the background information. I spent over a year and a half researching the book, talking to many, many old retired players about their uh, contemporaries. For example, a player like Burley Grimes, who's... Uh, an old Dodger spitballer, and he's about 89 years old, but he has a vivid uh, uh, memory, and he, he recalled a lot of what these players could do. And I rated pitchers, hitters, infielders, defensive players, everybody together, uh, overlapping all the eras, using uh, my own uh, observations as a sports writer and a fan going back totally some 40 years, and the evaluation of other people and coming up with the list uh, totally from 1 to 100 in order of their uh, skill, all, overall skill as a baseball player, putting in all the factors, not only offense, but defense, running, uh, throwing, and for pitches, uh, uh, how, how they won, what they, how well they performed under stress, and a lot of those intangible factors in coming up with this ranking of 1 through 100. Maury, how long did it take you to do all of this? Uh, actually, I worked uh, over a year on uh, compiling the information, putting it all on little three-by-five cards, getting different opinions, putting in the, uh, the uh, statistics, uh, the same time's opinion of, of a lot of people, then jotting down my own memories of watching a lot of these players that I'd seen in the early uh, 1940s when I was just a small kid and going to, starting to go to games in, in New York here 
going into Ebbets Field where Brooklyn played, the Polo Grounds and Yankee Stadium. And probably would have been a lot quicker if I had a computer, but I didn't and, and just relied on these three by five cards. And when I finally got around to start writing it uh, about a year after I researched it, uh, I argued with myself quite often on a lot of these selections, but uh, finally started to make these decisions and, and put down player number one and wrote a story about him and, and put in a you know a real nice glossy photo of him and then player number two and number three and all the way down the line. We want to remind people here in Des Moines and uh, in Iowa that I'd like to talk to more Allen this afternoon about his book. The number here in Des Moines, 282-5111. Out-of-state callers can call direct, uh, 515 area code, same number, 282-5111. In-state Watts line, 1-800-532-1111. Maury, before we got you on the line, I said that you either had the temerity or the wisdom to go ahead and rank these players, and you have obviously taken the liberty to rank these players 1 through 100. I am sure that you are aware there is another book out that just came out a few months ago called The 100 Greatest Baseball Players of All Time by Lawrence Ritter and Don Honing. Now, Larry and Don didn't rank these players 1 through 100. They thought it would be very difficult to do that, and they couldn't break them down overlapping positions, and they thought it would be unfair to categorize the players 1 through 100 without respect to position. Why did you think you could rank these players without respect to position? Basically, I was going to try something that I felt had never been tried before. I think when we sit around ballparks and when we sit around... Uh, uh, sports writers sit around uh, hotel lobbies and, and maybe once in a while sneak into the hotel bar and have a have a cup of coffee or whatever we have in there. We sometimes uh, get into these kind of arguments about, uh, I think part of the fun of baseball is, is the link between the past and the present, the link between father and son, the link between the great heroes of the 20s, I mean the Babe Ruth and the Ty Cobbs and uh, Christy Mathewson and people like that, as against the current heroes. Uh, you know, is Reggie Jackson better than Babe Ruth? Is uh, uh, Tom Seaver better than Christy Mathewson? And the more I was around people and the more I discussed this, uh, the more the idea just absolutely fascinated me that never been such a rating. Nobody had ever to attempt to overlap eras, overlap positions. And I just felt it was a tremendous... Uh, uh, challenge and and uh, I wanted to do it both from the standpoint of satisfying my own judgments on these rankings and hopefully stimulating the fans uh, to uh, uh, looking at the rankings to deciding whether I'm completely out of my mind or whether they agree and then offering their opinions. I think the fun of this book is to to read it, to look at the rankings, and then to decide whether or not they think the rankings are accurate and to come up with their own rankings. I, I hope that anybody who buys the book, it's a, it's a paperback book, and get it in any bookstore. It's, it's $7.95, and I think it's a great value, uh, entertaining for all the family. It's a, it's a fun book. It's a wholesome, clean book, and uh, I think that it will stimulate argument, and if people can write me letters and, and uh, give me their opinions, and I hope to put out a sequel with a lot of the reaction of the uh, the baseball fans across the country and, and the fans in, in Des Moines and in Iowa I know are good baseball fans and I think they'd be interested in it. Maury, let's go ahead and run down the rankings 1 through 10. Willie Mays, you said, is the best player. Hank Aaron follows in second. Babe Ruth in third. Ted Williams, Stan Musial, Joe DiMaggio, Ty Cobb, Lou Gehrig, Walter Johnson, and Rogers Hornsby round out the top 10. I noticed that you only put one pitcher in the top 10 and that is sure to upset some pitching aficionados. Right. I think the point of, of all of that, uh, there are two two points I'd like to make here. One, I gave a lot of weight to uh, not only all-around skill, uh, hitting, defense, throwing, running, everything, but longevity. The, the players that were rated high were players who were excellent players, great players over a long period of time, uh, maybe 15, 18, 20 years. I think that's a significant test of, of the level of excellence in baseball. That's the one criterion that I look for throughout this list. The second was, how much did a man contribute to his team? And it, it was my conclusion in the listing, certainly of the first ten, that the everyday player, the, the Willie Mays, the Hank Aaron, the Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, those kind of players 
contributed in some way every day to the ball clubs they played with. A pitcher naturally uh, pitching only once every four days or now basically once every five days can only contribute on the days that, that he does pitch. So he had to be incredibly outstanding to, uh, to make the list at all. And I think Walter Johnson was the only pitcher that I deemed worthy of making the top ten, though in the, in the second ten, uh, we get into a lot of pitches. Uh, Christy Mathewson and Grover Cleveland, Lefty Grove, uh, down through Sandy Koufax, Bob Feller, Dizzy Dean, and so on. So I think the pitches certainly got their due. But in the top ten, I felt that the everyday great player was, was much more important. Maury, Willie Mays is ranked number one by you. What is uh, the criteria that you ranked Willie Mays as the top uh, player on your list? All right, I've had a lot of arguments. I had some arguments with myself when I first put it down and a lot of arguments with fans and other sports writers and other baseball people since. And the, the reason was I think Willie was maybe just a shade behind uh, Babe Ruth uh, as a hitter. He had 660 home runs, the Babe had 714. But I think the conditions changed in modern times. I think it's harder to play now. Uh, relief pitching is better. Babe Ruth never had to face these tough young relief pitches. Uh, relief pitches in Babe's day were usually washed up starters, so I think that was a factor. The other factor is the expansion of baseball since those days. Traveling across country, night ball, playing on artificial surfaces, playing under the tremendous media attention, uh, uh, in and out of hotels, uh, traveling under tremendous amount of stress, arriving in cities 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I just think athletes have a tougher time today. Uh, the other factor weighing heavily in, in uh, Willie Mays' side is against the Babe, as I gave a lot of weight to defense. Willie Mays, to my mind, was the single best defensive baseball player of all time. He could catch a fly ball. Uh, any place in the ballpark, he could throw, uh, he could run, he could cut off balls. Uh, he never missed a, a uh, cutoff man as an outfielder. And I think Babe Ruth, though a dominant home run hitter and a dominant offensive player, was from the middle of his career on less than uh, sensational as a defensive player. So he won very few games for the Yankees with his glove from the middle of his career on when he began to get a lot heavier and slow down. So that was really the factor in picking uh, Willie number one and Hank Aaron, who I thought was just a little bit behind Willie as number two. But on the other hand, Maury, and I, I need to get into this argument with you here, Babe Ruth was able to pitch in his early career with the old Boston team before he came to New York. Willie Mays, Hank Aaron didn't have a history of pitching. Babe Ruth could pitch and hit. Right, absolutely, and that's a very hard uh, point to defend. He was a great all-around athlete. I wouldn't uh, dare to, to demean any of the Babe's abilities, but I just felt that weighing the total career of Willie Mays and the total career of, of Babe Ruth, to my mind, uh, Willie could do more, win more games. He could win them on the bases. He could win them by intimidating a pitcher. He could win them with, uh, with a walk and a steal and... Uh, even though Babe was a great pitcher, as a matter of fact, when I rated the, the 10 greatest pitchers in, in the uh, supplementary section of the book, I actually rated Babe Ruth the third best left-handed pitcher of all time. But, but Babe's pitching career, of course, was relatively short, about uh, four or five regular seasons, and he, he, of course, was judged on his all-around play then on. But I think it just makes a lot of... Uh, uh, discussion and argument, but to my mind, and maybe it's a court because, of course, I saw Willie play uh, quite a lot over 20 years, and I did not see the Bay play that I just sort of uh, leaned toward Willie. There's another factor I'd like to bring up there, too, but we don't have time to get into it right now. Perhaps I can bring it up after the half-hour break here. It is 129 on WHO Saturday Sports Line. Our guest is Maury Allen, a New York Post sports writer and boy oh boy i'm sure having fun going in on this but we have some callers on the line too 282-5111 is the local line 1-800-532-1111 is the toll-free watts line for the state of iowa stay with us Of all 
the cities under the summer sun, probably none shines brighter than Vancouver, British Columbia. The city has 18 beaches, and right in the center of town, 1,000-acre Stanley Park and a view of the mountains. Tea time at the Empress Hotel in Victoria is a must as is a trip to Bouchard Gardens with its acres of English roses and exotic Japanese cherry trees. Shop for China and woolens right around town on a double-decker bus. Victoria is still a bit Victorian. So come on up to Canada, because this summer, as ever, you're welcome at our place. This invitation from the Canadian government. The time here at WHO is 1.30, 70 degrees in downtown Des Moines. Time for Iowa Sports with Larry Kotler. Well, speaking about baseball, as they say, when it rains, it pours. And so far, it's pouring over the Iowa Oaks this season. The uh, Oaks were victims of late inning scoring in a doubleheader with the Redbirds in Springfield last night. The Oaks lost both games, dropping the opener 8 to nothing in the nightcap 5-4. to four. Springfield scored six runs in the sixth inning to put the opener out of reach. They scored two runs in the seventh inning to tie the final game at four runs. And then the Redbirds finally scored one run in the bottom of the ninth to take a 5-4 win. Meanwhile, in the Midwest League last night, Kevin King belted a pair of two-run homers to spur Wausau to an 8-1 victory over Wisconsin Rapids. However, the Twins rallied for a 3-1 win in the second game of their doubleheader. In other action, Bob Schreck struck out 13 as Burlington edged Cedar Rapids 2-1. Waterloo topped Appleton 8-5, and the Quad City Cubs blind Clinton 4-0. Iowa State's C Scott Kroll has been working all year for a 200-foot throw in the discus. It finally came yesterday in the Big 8 Conference Track Championships in Ames. It was a superb toss, sailing 206 feet 6 inches. The throw by the junior from Mason City, the previous Big 8 meet record, and uh, was the second best in the country this year. The old record, 198.5 by Missouri's Ben Plunknet in 1976. Thanks to Kroll, a 2-3-4 finish in the 10,000 meters, and James Moy second in the long jump, the Iowa State team Leads the team standings heading into today's final events. Iowa State, by the way, has not won a league track crown since 1945. They have 37 points, Nebraska 23, Kansas State, and Missouri with 22 each. And surprisingly enough, Kansas, which has won 19 of the last 23 titles, is tied for fifth place back at 19 points. Oklahoma enters today's final round of events of the women's Big 8 track championships in first place, Sooner freshman Kathy Kelly, or Kelly Kathy, rather, uh, won the 3,000-meter run in 9 minutes, 39.29 seconds, defeating defending champion Debbie Vetter of Iowa State. Uh, she took third, and Missouri's Margaret Smith was second. Oklahoma also got first-place finishes from Cecil Hansen, the shot put, and Javelin. The Sooners have 53 points, 42 for defending champion Nebraska. Iowa State third in the team standings with 37 points. The AIAW Region 6 Tennis Championships continue today in Iowa City. Yesterday, unracked Minnesota shocked number one Iowa 5 to 4 in the second round. Minnesota also defeated Nebraska 8 to 1 in the opening round, while Iowa State edged a Wichita State 5 to 4. However, the Cyclones lost to Missouri of Columbia 6 to 3 in yesterday's final round. And Knox College of Galesburg, Illinois, is hosting the 59th annual Midwest Conference Track Meet today and tomorrow. Cole College of Cedar Rapids is trying for its 10th consecutive conference track title and has been tabbed the favorite in the pre-meet coaches' poll. More Iowa headlines a little later on this afternoon. Larry Kotler for WHO Saturday Sports Line. WHO. AccuWeather. AccuWeather for the state of Iowa it says mostly cloudy in the west, some sunshine, warm elsewhere this afternoon with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm in some central and western sections. Highs will range 74 northeast to 82 southwest. Generally cloudy, windy, and cooler tonight and tomorrow with showers over most of the state. Low tonight, 46 northeast to 55 southwest. Tomorrow's highs, 53 north to 68 in the south. And then on Monday, variable cloudiness and cool with showers still possible. Highs near 55 north to about 65 in the south. AccuWeather for Des Moines says uh, some sunshine and warm this afternoon with a thunderstorm in some spots later on, a high near 80. Mostly cloudy, windy, and cooler tonight and tomorrow with showers. The low tonight, 51. Tomorrow's high about 65. 
Looking ahead to Monday, variable cloudiness and cool with showers still possible, the high near 60 degrees. Now 70 degrees in our downtown studios, 73 out at the airport, partly cloudy skies. The winds are coming from the southeast at 18, gusting to 27. Relative humidity 28%, the pressure rising from 30 inches even. On the line, Maury Allen, a New York Post sports writer, and he has ranked the 100 greatest baseball players of all time. Go ahead and give us a call. Back in just a moment. a terrific old-time value with participating Happy Chef restaurants. A large 16-ounce Coca-Cola is just a dime when you order any sandwich. Happy Chef, it's good. Just order any sandwich from the big new Happy Chef menu. And that large Coke is yours for just 10 cents. It's another special reason why... At Happy Chef, it's good. You'll find Happy Chef restaurants throughout Iowa, including Des Moines, Ames, and Story City. At Happy Chef, it's good. The time here at WHO is 1.36. We're talking to Maury Allen, a New York sports writer. He's ranked the top 100 baseball players, personal ranking. On the line, we have a question about Willie Mays. Go ahead. Oh, not a question. I think I'd just like to give a little credence to Mr. Allen's argument of Willie Mays being the best ball player. Uh, I don't know how, I'm sure Mr. Allen is. I don't know how many other people are aware of the fact that when you, when you go into organized ball, when you sign with a parent club, you're, they start rating you. You're rated in five categories by your coaches, your scouts, managers, people you're associated with, people that have the power of moving you on or not. You're rated as whether you can hit for power, whether you can hit for average, uh, run, field, and throw. To the best of my knowledge, I well, I broke in at the same time as Willie Mays. We were both playing minor league ball at the same time, and he was always held. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any other player that's ever rated over 80% in all categories. Uh, if there's been one, I'd like to know. It's been long been my contention that Willie Mays was probably the best mechanical ball player that ever played the game. Uh, this is the first authority that I've ever heard support that conviction. I've heard Ruth held up and Williams and several others. That's an interesting point, and uh, uh, I really appreciate somebody knowledgeable like yourself suggesting that, and it backs up my opinion. I think there's another thing that is almost immeasurable, and uh, it's one of the factors that I uh, lean heavily on in judging Willie, number one, and that's simply baseball instinct. The, yeah. the, abil the instinct, the almost mechanical or biological instinct, to do the right thing on the field at the right time. And I think nobody who, ever, who played the game ever had those kind of instincts that uh, Willie did. And it's In fact, something that can't be taught. Right. And no, it was a famous a play that Willie himself cites when he was uh, elected to the Hall of Fame, and we asked him what was the greatest play he ever made. And he cites this one play in which there was a game against the Brooklyn Dodgers, and somebody hit an incredibly... Uh, hard line drive into uh, left center field, and Willie ran over and being a right-handed uh, thrower, uh, couldn't get the, the glove over to the left so to the right side of his body, and play. simply leaned over and caught the ball in one bounce with his bare hand. I remember the play, and it was just unreal. Mm -hmm. And uh, Willie talked about it and said that yeah. no other human being could ever do that. Nobody would ever even attempt such a thing. And he held the guy to a single, and the next guy hit a hit a uh, single, and the runner only went to second base, and they got out of the inning, won a big game. And it's just an instinct that can't be taught. The Sir, thing... thank you very much for the call, and we have some other calls we simply need to get to. Thank you so much, and go ahead and try us again if you have the time or inclination. Let's take another call here. Good afternoon. You're on Saturday Sports Line with Maury Allen. Yeah, uh, he said he ranked Willie Mays above Babe Ruth, and he mentioned he's 
Watchful, he may play a lot of baseball in 20 years. Did that have a big factor in his uh, ranking of Willie Mays number one? Yes, that, that obviously was a big factor. I, I never did see uh, Babe Ruth play. Uh, <clears throat> I met him a little bit at the, at the, towards the end of his life. He died in 1948. Uh, but, of course, I saw Willie Mays play for 20 years, and, and I couldn't imagine anybody doing more things on a baseball field correctly and to help his team as much as Willie Mays. And to my mind, he simply was the, the absolute best there was. And, and uh, I'll argue that with any Babe Ruth fan or with anybody that saw any of the old players, nobody could do what Willie Mays could do. And, of course, I was influenced by watching him, but I really feel sincerely that he, he simply was the best. And Mike, we already brought up the fact that Babe Ruth was, already, you know, once, you know, was a great pitcher, and you said you ranked him third among your all-time left-handers. Uh, I got one question for you. Who holds the, between Babe Ruth and Willie Mays, who's got the most lifetime World Series stolen bases? Uh, that's a tough statistic, and I probably don't know it. <laughs> well, it's uh, Babe Ruth's got more World Series stolen bases than Willie Mays. That's interesting. Yeah, it's that's just a thought that, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, Babe Ruth could do that's not, people don't really, you know, realize. Sure. He's a home run hitter, and he also has a great average. I don't know how, how do you compare averages back in, the 20s and the 30s. Yeah, I think one of the things that I try to do in this book was overlap the eras, and I just think that uh, a 300 average today is harder to compile than a 300 average was in, in uh, Babe's time. I think the significant thing was the uh, relief pitching and the quality of, of pitching. Athletes are simply better today. The, the pitchers today are better trained, have much more uh, training as they begin their careers. From The coaching is better. A school training is better. A high school player today is a much better athlete than a, than a high school player was in, in the Babe's day. And as they go on into professional ball, there are so many specialists in their training, so I just think athletes are better. And a 300 average simply means more today. What was uh, Babe Ruth's uh, final batting average total lifetime? Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it was 341. Yeah, something like that. So and what, and uh, what? Willie's was about uh, 310 or so. But I think uh, Willie missed two years in the service. He had 660 home runs. The Babe had 714. And I think if Willie played it uh, the other two years, uh, when they were peak seasons, he would have passed the Babe in home runs. I think his average might have been uh, 20 points below. But he did so many other things that I just leaned to him. Well, okay, but I, I think Willie May's average is a little lower than 310. I don't, I'm not sure. I thought it was around 302. But uh, that's just – anyway, I'm a Babe Ruth fan, and right. I think that he's – he got shown his contemporaries by so much in those era, and uh, to me, to my knowledge, Willie Mays did not shine his contemporaries as nearly as much as Babe Ruth had shown his. Right. I think uh, the fun of this book is I give these different points, and uh, everybody's entitled to his opinion. And as I suggest, this is my ranking, and uh, every fan is entitled to his own ranking. And I think if you pick up the book, you'll have some fun looking at it, and then you can come up with your list and send it on to me. And I, I hope to compile a lot of. Uh, fans' rankings in another edition, so and, I think you'll have a good time. And these arguments aren't vindictive or hateful sorts of arguments. These are fun types of arguments. Let's go ahead and take a local call here. Good afternoon, sir. Glad to have you on again. Oh, okay. Thanks. I just have to lend, lend pardon me, a little more credence. I think the analogy that was just made as to who had the most stolen bases in the World Series doesn't hold any water at all. Uh... Pardon me. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I can only picture Willie Mays in one World Series. And how many did Babe Ruth play in? Yeah, I think Babe played in uh, seven. And I think Willie wound up playing in a total uh, in four. He was in three with the uh, Giants and one at the end of his career with the uh, New York Mets in 1973 when he was 42 years old. And he really wasn't able to play very yeah. well anymore. Yeah, and uh, the other thing that you mentioned that I think just can't be overlooked is longevity. Uh, I, I'm in total agreement. And this guy, if you really, if you ever got to watch him, uh, I, hey, believe me, I was a Musial fan, too. I watched Musial for years at the same time I was watching Mays. Right. And I've never seen a guy do so much right so many times for so long a period as Mays did. 
Yeah. I, I, and I even I even saw him drop a fly ball in uh, Old Sportsman's Park in St. Uh -huh. Louis. <laughs> that <laughs> was a rare was occasion, human. but uh, yeah. Willie was the kind of player that uh, if he did drop a fly ball, of course we're talking about human beings and, and the game of baseball is not a mechanical game and people do make errors and so forth, but if he dropped a fly ball in a game... Uh, I'm sure that he did something else in that game to, to help oh, yeah. his team. Yeah. Yeah. And that's basically the kind of player he was. And uh, when we're talking, I think what, what should be pointed out is when we're talking about these players, even the 100 that I have in my list, regardless of where they're rated, when, when you finish in the top 100 among 10,000 players over 80 years, you have to be a pretty great baseball player, and even the players who were in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s on my list uh, were quality baseball players, and it is sometimes very well, difficult to separate right. them. And I know I had a tough time separating them when I made the list. Up. I got one quick question. Where did you have Williams? Uh, Williams finished uh, number four. And the reason for that, right behind Babe Ruth, is obviously, uh, to my mind, he was the single best hitter I ever yeah. saw, just as yeah. a hitter, but Batman. a below-average fielder, a below-average runner. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't think he was a great team player, and I thought he had a lot of uh, gaps in his overall playing ability, uh, but his hitting was so incredible that yeah. you had to rate him at least fourth. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, sir. we got about 30 seconds more before we have to go to the AP Sports Summary. Steve Carlton was not on the list. We talked about that at the bottom of the hour. Explain why Steve Carlton is not in the top 100. Well, the subtitle of the book is A Personal Ranking of the Best Players in Baseball History, and Steve Carlton has chosen for the last 10 years of his, of his career not to talk to sports writers, and I've chosen not to put him in this list, so we each have our own way of doing things, and I think he's a great pitcher, but any man who sees fit not to talk to uh, writers and not to help the fans get to know him. Okay, Mark, thank you. We have to, we'll be back with you in just a little bit now. Stay tuned for the AP. A couple of games are in progress now in baseball. First up, the American League after two at Cleveland. No score. Toronto playing Cleveland. Todd against Garland. No score after one. California, Detroit. Rod goes against Rosema. Just starting, Baltimore at Minnesota. Still will face Kuzman. And after one frame at Fenway in Boston, the Royals top Boston by a score of one nothing. Gura takes on Eckersley. Tonight, Seattle at New York. Oakland at Milwaukee. Texas at Chicago. In the National League, just two day games this afternoon after one complete no score at Pittsburgh. The Pirates playing Cincinnati. Lacoste goes against Scurry. Montreal at San Francisco later. The big story in baseball last night did not involve Tim Raines, Fernando Valenzuela. It took place in Cleveland and involved pitcher Len Barker. In case you missed the story, Barker became the first man in 13 years to pitch a perfect game. The performance just the 11th in baseball history. Rick Manning is the Indian center fielder and he caught the last out of the game. It was going too good for me to play back, and, you know, they weren't hitting many balls good. But the last thing I wanted to see was a ball off the end of the bat, shake in between the infield and the outfield. If they hit one over my head, then I just figured that, you know, Mark would have made a mistake on the ball. The last perfect game was thrown by Catfish Hunter back in 1968. The University of Pittsburgh has given football coach Jackie Sherman a five-year contract. The Panthers finished the 80 campaign with 11 wins and just one defeat. Kentucky Derby winner Pleasant Connelly is favored to win today's Preakness in Baltimore. The weather forecast for the race looks good, and the track should be in pretty good condition. This is Jack Briggs on the Sports Line. <laughs> This is Bob Williams speaking for the Glenn Miller Birthplace Society in Clarinda, inviting you to join me Saturday night at 9.05 on WHO for the Bob Williams Big Band broadcast. Glenn Miller music will be featured, and you'll hear exciting details about the Glenn Miller Festival in Clarinda Saturday, May 23rd. Hear Miller music and festival news at 9.05 Saturday through May 16th. Then I'll broadcast live and direct on WHO from the festival in Clarinda, Saturday, May 23rd. You be there, too. It's too bad that someone can't come up with a better word than flavor to describe the 14 different varieties of Scandra's old-fashioned premium quality ice cream. Flavor just doesn't do justice to the authentic, natural taste you experience from each of these delicious products. Scandra's starts with a great vanilla. 
But when you get to the other varieties, you're talking about real chunks of peppermint candy that go into the peppermint bonbon, real strawberries in Scandra's strawberry ice cream, and generous chunks of almond in Scandra's toasted almond fudge. Jim Zabel inviting you to try Scandra's old-fashioned premium quality ice cream. Scandra's. It gives flavor a whole new meaning. 148 in the afternoon here at WHO, 70 degrees again in downtown Des Moines. And Maury Allen is on the line talking about baseball's top 100. And uh, during the break, Maury talked about uh, rating some of the players on defensive skills only. And he mentioned uh, Mark Belanger, who was rated uh, number 97 on Maury's list. Why don't you run down some of those again, Maury, and uh, fill us in on some of those players. All right. I just feel very strongly that uh, defensive players have always been ignored in the uh, total concept of baseball. The home run hitters and the big offensive guys get the attention, get the uh, the commercials and all the rest of it. But no team wins without great defensive players. So I gave a lot of weight to defense, and I have about three or four players on my list uh, who were basically defensive players. Number 74, Marty Marion, the great shortstop of the Cardinals. Number 70. Six on my list, Phil Rizzuto, the great shortstop of the Yankees. 78, Pee Wee Reese, the great shortstop of uh, the old Brooklyn Dodgers. And 97, Mark Belanger, the great shortstop of the uh, Baltimore Orioles. I think that the Baltimore team, which was basically uh, one of the greatest teams in the last 20 years, uh, built their team around pitching and defense. And even though Mark Belanger's lifetime average is something like uh, 220, his defense was so significant, his player shorts up so significant that I felt he deserved the place as, as one of the greatest 100 baseball players of all time. I notice on the list you have, uh, I know there's some Twins fans that always listen to WHO. Harmon Killebrew is ranked number 70 on the list. And uh, behind him are some players that uh, personally I would see, I would feel would be ahead of him. Guys like Dave Parker and uh, uh, George Brett, who's number 82, Dave Winfield, Nolan Ryan, Fred Lynn. Why is uh, Harmon Killebrew uh, up? Up to number 70. Uh, again, we're talking about a dominant home run hitter. He was not a high average hitter, but he had uh, 570 home runs, something like that. I forget the exact figure. Uh, also, longevity. We're talking about a player who played for 20 years and was very, very consistent as an offensive player for, for that period of time. He also was one of the most significant RBI guys. Not a great fielder, not a great thrower, a great runner, obviously, but a very, very significant offensive player. The other players that you mentioned, uh, Brett and, and uh, uh, players who are playing now, like Winfield and uh, uh, Fred Lynn, and players like that who are rated behind Harmon Killebrew, have not yet put in that kind of time. And uh, to me, a player who excels for 20 years uh, deserves that kind of mention if he can keep up that performance for that long period of time. Maury Allen, New York Post sports writer, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. He is the author of Baseball's 100, a personal ranking of the greatest players in baseball. And I appreciate the fact that you were on today, Maury, and we would like to have you on sometime later. We can arrange that perhaps afterward. We had a great deal of interest this afternoon, and so we will go ahead and arrange that off the air. It is 1.51 in the afternoon, and Jim Zobel's commentary this afternoon treats the subject of a possible baseball strike.